Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has entered the building. What are you saying? I was saying Elvis has entered the building. I've got, so, gotten big in my old age. <laughs> okay, yes, no, that's what I was saying. So, Wayne, I want to get right to the beginning of this. So, why did you, after all this time, suddenly decide to write a book? Or is this something you've been thinking about doing for a long time? I had nothing better to do. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's not, not quite true. Um, when we did the, I think this is the last mission album in 2016, another fourth of grace, got to the point where I just felt exhausted creatively, musically, and I just thought, well, it's time to do something else. And um, I've been um, pestered by certain people close to me to write a book because they said, your stories are great. And it's like, really? And I never thought I had the discipline to do it, which is, um, I love books, but I thought that discipline, yeah. But actually the process, the whole process was brilliant. And I, I mean, really enjoyed getting up in the morning, having my coffee and writing. And um, <clears throat> After about, I mean, to make, sometimes took, you know, one, two hours before I got into the, the groove. But once it came, it was just like, yeah, this is good. And, uh, you know, the, the words came, the, the memories came, and it was a good thing. I mean, initially, initially I mean, obviously, everyone's got war stories, being on the road. Yeah. Um, you know, when you get to get your mates, you tell a lot of stories. Was that the, the original kernel of the spine of the book? And you're writing those down? Well, or did you put those in last? No, it's more people telling me what I got up to, actually. <laughs> Do you remember this? No. <laughs> but I will jot this down and remember this for later. Are you quite surprised you got through it all? No, uh, no because I know myself. And when I set my, set my mind to do something, I usually do it. So, but but um, it, it took me a little while to come to, to terms with the idea of writing a book. Because as I say, I'm, I'm a big fan of books. And I just never thought myself capable of it, actually. Was there a lot of rewrites and edits? And... Uh, yeah, I would, I would write a chapter and go back and edit it myself and then go back and, to, you know, reread it, re -read it and find some posh words to put in and make, think <laughs> and make me sound intelligent. And, and did uh, you get someone to interview you as well? To... No, but I interviewed my mum for the book. Oh, did you? What was that? <laughs> that was quite good. So I, I learned good. quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then what kind of things would you not know already? Well, I mean, I knew I was um, adopted by my dad, but I didn't know this whole story of how, or um, who, I, I kind of knew my, my um, uh, father was American. But I knew very little about him. So she told me all about that stuff and her whole, her whole story of um, almost giving me up for adoption and then at the last minute changing her mind. I didn't know any of this. It's just, that's quite emotional stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a very close relationship with my mum, but she comes from a generation that that kind of stuff is kind of taboo. I mean, even some of my siblings didn't know, you know. And it was one of those, also, because they're religious. It's one of those things, it's like, okay, push, push, put it under the carpet, you know. But um, when, when I was writing the book, I just began to feel that it, that was actually an integral part to the person I am and became. And um, so I asked, asked her if it would be okay to put, put it in, because I know both her and dad would always be, like to kind of keep it quiet. So she that, quite, quite open then? Yeah, she was. I mean, in the end, I mean, they, they had a conversation, they called me back a few days, like, yeah, go on, it's okay, we'll put that in, you can put that in the book. Finally, finally. So get that it out. was yeah. actually, the first chapter was actually the last chapter I wrote. Yeah, that's, that's quite a good way of doing the book, though, isn't it? I think yeah. it is, yeah. I mean, a lot of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because when you get to the last chapter, you kind of know what you need from the first chapter. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the first chapter otherwise started with, um, God, what was it? I don't know, living next to a church, I think. Yeah. It's, you know, quite boring, really. Yeah. When you go back to those bits, you speak to them all, and you go back to being your life. I mean, and it's, obviously it's really formative in Portland, but what kind of things are really important in that, you know, the early years that affected you later on? Well, first of all, um, in, when 
I was born, I was born in a home for about nine, nine months to a year because my mum didn't have um, a facility to keep me. You know, she was a young girl in the 50s and uh, she had nowhere to live and, 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 and stuff and, and didn't have a job. So, she, you know, she got her life together and then got, got herself in a situation where she could take me out of the children's home. And whilst I can't remember any of that, I'm sure it has an impact on your, your, your personality, on, on the, you know, where you, you are. And then uh, she lived with her mum and her sisters. So basically I just had women around me all the time, which is actually quite nice. Um, and I guess, you know, I kind of got spoiled a little, uh, which is... Um, yeah, I think I think all of that, you know, adds up to make you who you are. You know, I think your basic personality is forged when you're quite young, and uh, un unwittingly and un unknowingly, you know, all these factors add into, you know, my my want, my need, or whatever it is to to be loved by this. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of women were they? You know, your mother and your sisters were they, were they quite different from each other, or was there? No, they, 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 I mean, they were quite close. They were, you know, they're, they're, my mum was two years older than their next sister, and who was two years older than the younger sister. They had an elder brother who had left home by that point. But, you know, I mean, as I say in the book, you know, I mean, for, for years I thought I was, I thought I was, the, you know, God because I was the only one with a, a winkle. <laughs> it's like, why haven't you got one? <laughs> and it's like, wow, I'm different. But uh, I found out. Later, that I wasn't. Well, were they quite religious? Was it? Was no, not religious. at all. Not but that, that religious thing was played out in the background. No, no. My, my mum was uh, converted to Mormonism when I was about six or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, so not at that point. So, so when she did that, though, did that change the dynamic at all? Mormonism. Yeah, of, of you growing up, would you make those differences? Of course, it became, did, this became the centerpiece of our lives, you mm -hmm. know, socially. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously spiritually as well. I mean, uh, instead of spending evenings at the local youth club, I'd go to church, you know, and uh, do that thing. Was this completely out of the blue? Did she always have a religious side to her? No, I think she, she'd been ill with tuber tuberculosis. And I think at that point she was quite close to dying at one point. And I think it just made her kind of reevaluate or, or or be open to um, to other things. So you know, two young handsome men come knocking on your door, you know, it's like, hey, come in. <laughs> this is my husband. <laughs> you know, and, and um, I, yeah, so she she was obviously at that point in her life looking for something else, something more. And uh, yeah, so they, she invited the Mormons in and Hence, here we are. And what, so what, for you, at six or seven, did that, it's, quite, it's young enough to just seem like well, that's just normal, or did it seem, no, it wow, seemed what's normal, going on? It seemed normal. Normal. I mean, all, you know, she started going to church and started taking me with her. Very soon she started taking my younger brother as well. You know, so it became normal. You know, it became normal to go to church on Sundays and then go to church on Tuesday evening and a Friday evening, you know, and, and it was normal. It was normal. Then on a Saturday evening we'd have a social event Mormon church dance or something, you know, sports event. Did you, did you actually believe in it or was too young to actually understand it? I was indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I believed I believed. Mm. It was only when I became a, a teenager that I started questioning things and I started going, oh, oh, for a little while, I started going to other churches and to see, you know, what they had on offer. You know, it's like, is this is Catholic better than Mormonism or is, you know, being Jehovah's Witness. And basically, I, I, came, I came to the conclusion that um, I didn't believe in any of it, actually. You know, I, 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 it's like it all just seemed nonsense to me. Uh, and uh, I don't um, begrudge my childhood for, 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 for any of that. I don't begrudge my parents for bringing me up that way. And I don't begrudge them any of their beliefs that they still hold. That, it's brilliant that they have that. I wish, in some respects, that I did.
did too, because I, I have no idea what the fuck you believe in. That certainty, that certainty yeah. is just like, wow, I wish I had it. Yeah. I don't know, you know. All what? I believe in is Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> They'll always let you down. Well, yes, 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 yes. So when did the first crack start to appear? You know, in the, in the belief system. Was it was it rock and roll? Was no, it, was I don't it think it, I know it was rock and roll. I just think it was the natural course of events. You know, you get to a point where you 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 know you you're, you're more aware of yourself, self-aware, and you you're more. You look around you, and the kids at school are different. And it's like, why are they different to me? And um, they go to the youth club, and they talk about kissing girls and other things. And it's like, that kind of sounds quite good. And, um, you know, Mormons don't do that. <laughs> well, they must, they must. Well, eventually, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I've been to Salt Lake City, and you know, I know what those Mormon girls can get up to. <laughs> And they're not going to hell for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's the thing. There's, there's, when you have that structural upbringing, there's always a danger of a very extreme reaction. And you well, may be an example of this. Oh, I don't know, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I, yeah, I do think that, you know, looking back, I, I don't, I think my childhood in many ways was quite idyllic. I, you know, I don't feel traumatized by anything that happened in my childhood or even in my teenage years. Um, and, and in many ways, I think the values I was raised with has actually held me in good stead. Um, at the same time, by the time I was in my early 20s and being in bands, it was like, okay, what's this white stuff on the table? I'll have a little bit of that. Give me some more. Oh, what's that red stuff in the, in the, in the glass? Yes, give me some of that. And you know, I, I followed that course for a few years with, um, with zeal. <laughs> it's interesting you say it held you in good stead the early years. I mean, is there still traits of of being brought up as a Mormon that that you still have? I don't know about. I I, I feel listen. Uh, I feel that I'm a generally decent person. I'm flawed for sure, and and you know I do things that I think oh, you know <laughs> behave yourself, you know. But as a person. Uh, I think you know, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm easy to get on with. I think, uh, generally, I know what I want, and when people um, I'm working with see that, and I'm working with them, and they come along with me for the ride, it's great. But when they oppose that, then that's when you know there's a little bit of friction. Yeah. I can be bossy bugger for sure, <laughs> but. Um, I think generally, I, I, you know, I live my life and, and I, I just want to treat people the way that I would want to be treated. I think better of people rather than the worse when I first meet them. So there's a decency that maybe comes to that background, would you say? Yeah, decency and, 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 and yeah, a decency. I don't know if that's the right word, but a, 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 a kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's, there's a kindness inherent in probably most religions, actually. You know what I mean? And that is the good thing about Christianity, if you want, or, or, or religion, is that there, there is a kindness to it. That is the, 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 the essence of it to me. It's not about some guy being crucified on a cross, you know, it's about being kind. Mm. Like the moral, the, the old, not, not, not the, even moral, yeah. it's, it's, you, know, you know, you don't have to. I mean, you're talking about conventional morals, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, not, not when people whack you on the head for morals, but, you know, like, like I say, a niceness, a generosity of spirit. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah. you and I were talking in that. You're, you're a good person, I know you are. I've only really met you twice. Well, no, I would bet on it. Well, no, I would, I would. I would bet on it, big yeah. time. I'd met you twice, and, and I, you know, you get a sense of these things. Mm. Anyway, but, that's enough about me, so. <laughs> So, so when, did, when did rock and roll enter this? Because it, it seems like a kind of background. A lot of people grow up and their, their mums and dads are playing records or they have the radio on, but I can't imagine that was your background, was it? Oh, it well, was it was music? Yeah, 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 yeah it was. was. You know, my mum and dad loved music. I mean, you've got to remember, they were teenagers in the 50s. Mm. Elvis came along, wow. Mm. Elvis, you know, it's like revolution. Oh, so they could have both, yeah. Well, when they were teenagers, they weren't in the church. Oh, for, of course, yeah. 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 And then, um, but even, even the church could still listen to music. 
you know, Water Blue Sunset's a great song, mm -hmm. but Lola, that's a bit suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so some pop culture could get sieved through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in our house, they, they would go out and buy the seven inch singles, you know, the, the vinyl. Do you people out there that are too young to remember, music used to be just <laughs> seven inch little round things. <laughs> Uh, vinyl <clears throat> and they, uh, they were great you know so we had an A side and a B side mm -hmm. and uh, yeah they go out and buy singles you know and they, they play them in the house and they have radio <coughs> one and it was that was all right you know it was cool so what, what was your first kind of pop music memories Beatles. Beatles. Mm -hmm. the Beatles really I mean you know 1962 63 when the Beatles first came along I remember I mean they were a phenomenon uh, I don't think the world had ever seen anything like that before, and uh, certainly not from four scallywags from Liverpool. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the Beatles, you know, the mum and dad used to love the Beatles and uh, they used to play the records. They even bought a tea towel, actually, a purple and white tea towel with their autographs on. I wish we still had it. My well, dad framed it. You know, he got some wood and framed it. It was on the living room wall. Is that, is that yeah. when your interest in Liverpool started? You just <coughs> Liverpool and you lived there later on? No, no, no. That came a couple of years later, actually, mm -hmm. when uh, 1965 FA Cup final. Mm -hmm. And um, it was between Liverpool and Leeds. And we had to choose a team. You know, when you're on the oh, school. That's so you had, random. Yeah. Well, it is kind of random, but I had a friend at school who was only there that year. He, he left uh, that summer. And he was from Liverpool, so, you know, he's my friend. I'm going to support the same team as you. You know what? My life could have been shit. Could have been shit. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> so the Beatles, are, so they give you your sort of pop music intro in the way. So where's the journey go from there? I guess... Well, there's the Beatles and there's the, the Stones music. and the Kings, the Walker Brothers, the Righteous Brothers, all those great records, 60s, and the Animals. Great records, great. I mean, they still sound great. The Beach Boys, you know, fantastic. I mean, it's purely as a listener here, you know. Are you, are you, are you one of those people starts getting fascinated by how these things get made, or you just no, you no, just, just decide to write the sound of Yeah, yeah, just the songs, just songs. Really, it's not even the sounds; it's the songs mm -hmm. for me. The melodies. It's, it's always the song, yeah, mm. yeah. And did, was it like a portal into another world at all? Was you fascinated that level? You know, these people look different. You seem exciting. No, not really. I mean, you, you know, I mean, uh, the Beatles were up there compared to everybody else. So, they, you know, every Christmas, Hard Day's Night would be on TV. I loved that yeah. film. I lo still love that film. It's great. Um, and um, what else was Help later, which was a bit kind of a bit more weird. It's like they're obviously taking drugs by then. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, no, it, it wasn't the way they looked because I didn't really know how they looked apart from the Beatles because we had the tea towel and more. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, they're just great songs. I remember actually one of my favourite songs of that time being Keith West and um, Grocer Jack, Grocer Jack. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That one? Yeah, 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 it's great. Yeah, it's great. So what was the first music that really felt like your music? You know, was there, you know, when we get to 12, 13, was, was it a Bowie moment? Was it that? No, it moment? was a Boland moment. Yeah. It was um, seeing uh, Mark Boland on top of the Pops, mm -hmm. uh, Telegram sound. What, what was it, the whole package? You looked amazing, sounded amazing. Just looked like a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's the moment you thought, I have to do this. Well, it yeah. was, you know, to that point, it was Kevin Keegan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, okay, no, Kevin Keegan's not as pretty as Mark Bowman. This looks a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, up until up to that point, I wanted to be a footballer, but I dare say that you know, I would have been, I would love to have played for Liverpool in England, but I probably ended up playing for Bristol Rovers, you know. So, <laughs> if anybody, yeah, yeah, so, you know. not that low level, is it? It's well, it's level, still quite yeah. low. Yeah. I mean, Bristol well, you got a good player then. So. I was, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. But I mean, not probably not as good as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say at that point, the Mark Bowler moment, a lot of people talk about Starman moments, but for you to tell yeah, no, Starman, Starman came, I mean, I, I remember seeing Bowie on the old Grey Whistle test before that, because 
I'd read that he was a friend of Bonin's. I was like, oh, I watched this guy. And he did, I think he did changes. I can't remember what else he did. Oh, you pretty things. And he just, I thought he just looked a bit funny in his little cream checked suit thing, <laughs> leotard thing, or body suit thing he had on. Uh, but it was, you know, okay, yeah, good. And then he did, yeah, he did the Starman thing on top of the top. It's like, okay, yeah, he's good too. <clears throat> I'll have a bit of that. So, so was that period, the performance period, and the glam rock period, or whatever? They weren't really glam rock. They no, but this just thing about labels. It, it, glam rock, rock came le later. It's like any movement, well, right? Mark Bowen started it. Yeah, but he wasn't glam rock. He was just, you know, this bopping elf in, in a, you know, with blue jeans and cheesecloth top with a little bit of glitter on the oh, hair. Yeah. So right? Yeah. But then, you know, glam rock came along and he started wearing, wearing the fe fe feather boas. But you get groups like, I mean, you get Gary Glitter, you get uh, Mud and things like that, which were. In hindsight, we're pretty rubbish, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't stand the test of time the same way that T Rex and Bowie did. Well, yeah, they were some rock jeans. Rock jeans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, this is the same with any movement. If you look back, you punk, whatever, um, new romantics, goth, whatever, the ones that are um, really good transcend those mov movements. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they exist and move on and they become something else. I mean, a, any movement is, it, it becomes, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, Dead weight, okay. Yeah, they, not just that, it becomes, um, when, it, when it goes overground and becomes popular, it becomes diluted mm -hmm. and it becomes a fashion. And when it becomes a fashion, that's when it starts to be, you know, not not to be any good really. That's when you start to get the um, the chances coming along and you know dressing, looking the same. The Joe Boxes of the world. <laughs> Second time they've been mentioned today. That's quite weird. Yeah, I just came to my head. I never. I have not heard that name for years. No. <laughs> they were here. They weren't so, goth, were they? <laughs> so Mark Bowen, Telegram Sound. And the, and you knew that's what you wanted, but how do you get to it? How do you get to that point? You know, do you do you pass your mum for the guitar? Like, what's the, what's the process? Well, um, for me, it was um, we went on holiday to Spain, and um, this was our first holiday abroad. We drove down in the, in the in the family car, stopped off on on route, and s slept in the car, and then drove down, and then we were in a campsite, and we got kicked off that campsite because. I met somebody, a young lad, who thought it was great fun to set fire to the rubbish bins. So I said, yeah, yeah, okay, let's do this. I was, I don't know, I was 12, I mean, no, maybe a little older, 13, 14, I should have known better, anyway. And um, so we set fire to some bins, and anyway, we got kicked off the, the campsite. So we, we had to pack up our tent, you know, the sun going down. And he's like, mum and dad, you're not gonna get it, you're not gonna get it. It's like, oh, you God. And then, um, so we had to leave, but the guy that I was friends with, he, he, you know, they left him alone. He was, he got away with it. So it's a lesson. It's a lesson I learned. I think, you know, just be careful who you befriend. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't learn that one so well, though, did you? No, I've, I've had a few. <laughs> yeah, I've fallen off the wagon a few times. But anyway, we ended up going to another campsite and having to set the tent up in, in the dark. You know, so I wasn't the most popular child. But on the way home, we drive driving home, we stopped off in Andorra and um, saw a guitar on the, on, the, on, the, on the wall of one of the shops we were in. And my mum and dad bought it for me. You know, they, they, I think it was probably, uh, I thought they, they head off this career that I might have had in arson. <laughs> so um, yes, so it's like okay, we'll buy you this guitar if you be a good boy. Mm -hmm. that, that was the deal. That was yeah. the deal. Yeah. So I, I took the guitar home and then I just basically, you know, I found a chord chord sheet and um, started learning chords. I was staying in the dressing room. The first chord I learned was that shape of A minor, which is also E. Mm -hmm. I liked A minor better than E because it's sad. Mm. And he is happy. 
and I wrote my first song, mm. and uh, it was just based around the A minor chord, just taking that little finger off, which is actually very sore. Mm. Oh yeah, because you've got a place to put your Yeah, fingers. I can't, I, yeah. yes, I, I don't, you've, uh, I don't know if you follow Mission Facebook and all the rest of it, but that finger is bollocked. <laughs> I need to go and have um, it fixed when I go home, so I can't play guitar today. I'm sorry. If you want me to sing, I'll sing. Now you put yourself on the spot. Of course, you don't want you to sing, do you? <laughs> when you walk through the storm, hold your hand. I might, I might save that one for later. <laughs> Or maybe not. Yeah. Or maybe not. Depends how the day pans out. Well, course. even if yeah. even if it doesn't pan out the way I hope, it's still a great song. Mm. It's, it, all allegiances aside, it's a great, great song. Mm. It's a communal song. It is it? a communal song. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and, it's, and, and you, as a musician, it's such a well-written song. You must recognise that. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. It right? is. Yeah. yeah. So even good. Frank Sinatra sang it. Mm. Yeah. But it never sounds as good as when the whole crowd sings it. No, no, no version does. Yeah, yeah. No version sounds as good as when it's sang it. Well, Celtic as well, actually. Mm, yeah, yeah, they sang it first. Anyway, we're digressing. Exciting talk. So the first, the first song you wrote, what, what was that like? What's it like? It's like a T-Rex yeah. song. Was it? Yeah. yeah. So completely great. Then. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it was great. I've been playing it on this tour. Mm. Occasionally, you know, it's, it's even the title was stolen from T Rex, Seagull Woman. I played it on this tour a few times. So, did you find it easy to? I mean, a lot of people struggle when they try to write a song for the first time. Did you just, well, no, you just go, wow, this, where did that come from? Or? No, not at all. I, 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 because I couldn't play anybody else's songs, so I made my own up. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, it's the same criteria now. It's like, oh, that's, I start off, you know. Trying to copy someone else's songs, like I uh, can't be bothered to learn that, but that sounds good. Oh, yeah. I'll have that. <laughs> and there's, there's a new song. I didn't know how that works. Oh, yeah. 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 Everything's in it, but a variation, isn't it? Yeah. I, I can't remember. I, it's been attributed to Picasso, I think, that um, uh, good artists that, borrow. Genius steals. Or genius steals. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not claiming to be genius. But you claim to steal. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah, I do steal. <laughs> what about lyrically? Because a lot of people find it very difficult to write lyrics. They might write, well, oh. you're 12, 13 here. Was that difficult from the start or easy from the start? No, it's it's always been very difficult. I mean, back then I just copied a lot of somebody else's lyrics and just, you know, left a line here, a line there. I'll put that, 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 that sounds good. Just that, a hook for melody. That, that's, that's mine now. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it's still it's still the most difficult part of songwriting process. You know, right? it's, it doesn't come naturally to me. Uh, for many years, as you probably know, I was a guitarist in, in bands, mm -hmm. and so I had some very good lyricists. And um, when you hold yourself up against some of these these people that I've worked with in the past, like, all right, I'm not very good. But I've gotten better at better over the years. I've got better, be gotten better at articulating what I want to say if I have something to say. But quite often, songs are just words to me that sound good. Mm. And later on down the line, you can start to attribute meaning to it that maybe wasn't there when you first wrote the song, which is okay. You know, I mean, it, it, I think of I Am The Walrus by John, John Lennon, who wrote that, and it's, it's nonsense, but it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. most, most of T-Rex songs, Mark Bowman songs, are nonsense, but they sound great. The brilliant lyrics. Yeah. They, they, well, they, they are brilliant lyrics because yeah. they're daft, they're, yeah. and they, 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 they don't have to mean anything. But they mean, but they mean everything because you can feel, that's the thing about pop, it doesn't have to be literal, does it? No, not you can, The way somebody sings it is the feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Telegram song. Sam, what the hell is that about? It's about everything. Telegram everything. Sam, it's great. Mm. One of the greatest song titles ever. Ever, yeah. Because ever. Yeah. it's mysterious as well. Because you don't know what it's about. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't even think Mark Bowman did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, I met um, Roland Bowman a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. I went to LA to uh, shoot a video of um, 20th Century Boy. Uh, that he, he was singing and I played guitar and did back and vocals on it, which was quite quite surreal at yeah, 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 it was like a full circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, he's a lovely 
young man, I think he must be in his early 40s now, mm. but there's something about him that's so innocent and um, almost naive, but he, he's still got this wonder about the world. It's kind of real because there, there's not many 40 year olds you meet that still has that. And I was, I was it's quite a, refreshing. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's good. So you, you've got the song, you've written the first song, do you think yeah. now I need a band, or how is that? Or you, yeah. is this just purely a hobby in the bedroom? No. As you said before, actually. You no, 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 no. What no. happened I was, to I was so driven. Within three weeks, I put the band together and we're taking the first gig. So how old were you then? 40, 50. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I wrote. I mean, the first week of playing guitar, I've written an album's worth of songs, you know, probably more. Wow. So you thought I'm quite good at this? There's a lot. No, I never. There. I never thought that. I've never thought that. <laughs> Have you not shocked that all these songs disappeared out? Of no, 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 no. Because it just, because seemed, natural. It just, it just seemed natural because I couldn't play anybody else's songs. Mm. I wish I could. If I if if I could have applied myself and copied somebody else's songs verbatim, then maybe I would have gone a different route. Mm. You would have known how to write a proper a proper song. <laughs> uh, but knowing and doing it, I sometimes think knowledge gets in the way. Mm. Actually, certainly with music. When, when, you, when you get to the point where you know, okay, this chord works with this chord, but it doesn't work with this chord, that actually can get in the way. That's what I like writing on piano these days, because I don't play the piano very well, but I can play enough to, to, to move around and think, ooh, that's a nice chord. I don't know the piano as well as I know the guitar. So the chord suggests the melody, or do you sometimes so wake up the melody in your head already and work it out the other way around. No. So it's always like you just play a chord, you can hear all the little tunes in it. Yeah. yeah. And I quite, I mean, certainly what a part of my process these days is actually doing the whole backing track and taking away and then writing a melody and lyrics to the backing track. Oh, so the melody, that's the last part? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 But the, the chords have to suggest something. Mm. You know, when I'm doing it, it has to suggest something, otherwise it's like, mm, okay, that's not particularly nice. So the first gig, what was that like? I loved it. I wore um, blue velvet pantaloons. <laughs> what did you get those for? My mum made them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, your mum's really cool. She is yeah, really yeah. cool, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've asked her to make some more for me, but... Um... <laughs> but did you make the rest of the band dress up, or was that just one step too far that time? No, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know I had that much power at that point. <laughs> that came later, John. <laughs> Craig, you're wearing this. You see this stupid jacket? You're wearing it. Blue pantaloons. <laughs> no, I've, I've never put Craig in blue pantaloons. I would put Simon in blue pantaloons. Right? So, yeah. so yeah, the band was actually together. Because all I can remember for youth club bands when you started, no one knows how to do anything. No, we, could, we didn't know how to do anything. Of course, we didn't. But you could play in time. That's quite. A, that's I'm quite not a sure. Good. I'm not sure we did. Ish. Well, yeah. you know, it was brilliant, but I, I'm sure it was awful. Mm. You know, from if I went to see that band now, be, <laughs> there's no one there with any talent. Um, but basically, we played five or six songs. Um, all of them were self compositions, mm -hmm. apart from we did a cover version of Soul Love by David Bowie, which I had the David Bowie songbook and it was like, okay, G, E minor, C, I, I, I knew those chords, mm -hmm. but you know, the other, other songs of his are like posh chords, I can't play them. Yeah, like sevens, you yeah. have to move your finger about. <laughs> yeah, did yeah. um, the crowd like it, did that work? Well, there was about, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 people there. It was a, it was a youth night yeah, at yeah. the local church, at the, at the Mormon church. And uh, it's like, yeah, there were, you know, there were a few of them dancing and everything. It's like, yeah, this is good. Yeah. But um, then at the end of it, the, I was, you know, talking to all these, my friends, my, who were now my fans. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and then the, the, the Mormon bishop came over and said, that was too loud. You're never <laughs> playing here again. You're banned. <laughs> that was, I thought. That's the end of that. Then you made a basically clear. Right? Yeah, my mum and dad were, were distraught. They were devastated. Oh, really? That I I yeah. I'd actually pissed off the Mormon bishop that much. Yeah. And they weren't supportive of me. They were supportive of the bishop. Yeah. You should, you need to turn it down and play songs people know. 
In fact, I played in Bath on this tour, the last night in the UK, you know, on Wednesday night this past, mm -hmm. and my mum and dad came to the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the solo show goes where it goes, you know, they, they, they're not they're not always the big mission songs, you know, and they, they, they can be, they can be, they can go anywhere with the, the shows. But anyway, at the end of it, my mum, they took, I, I went home to stay with them that night, so I was driving home. What you need to do, Wayne, is play songs that people know. <laughs> <laughs> then you might, then you might do okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, 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 you might, you might, you might make a career out of this. <laughs> So even when you're 14, you didn't take their advice. So where did, where, did, where did you go next to that little youth club gig? Did it... Well, then when we moved, we moved home. So we moved where where we lived before was quite close to the school I was going to, and then we moved to a, a town that was five seven miles away, mm -hmm. and um, in this town, uh, because I was in, in the middle of my exam courses, I was in the fourth year by this point. They, they, the powers that be decided that it was best that I, I continue going to the old school. So I had to get the bus every morning, which was a mile trek across fields to get it before I even got on the bus. In all weathers, however you know. I mean, I wouldn't do it now, would you? I mean, kids wouldn't do it now. <laughs> oh, no. those days, right, go get the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, we didn't have dollies or anything, you know, it's just, you just turn up and you're soaked to the skin. <laughs> it's often you walk. Yeah, yeah. hardy hard yeah. stock we are, you know. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, and then, uh, so I, I, my band split up. Mm -hmm. And then I was, um, I, I would go home and play at home and write all these songs. I had exercises, exercise books full of songs. I wish I still had them. That you written? I'd written, yeah. I mean, literally, uh, hundreds of songs. And, uh, I mean, that's, most people, they struggle, I just want to say that, they most, when they start, they struggle to write one song, mm -hmm. and this stuff's pouring out of you, and you have no idea that this is not no, the normal no process. Idea. No, no, yeah. I, I, no, I thought, I thought the normal process was to write your own songs. Mm. Yeah, but people could write one or two, but not loads of exercise books full of them or whatever. Well, it was yeah. loads of them. Yeah. And the thing is, because I had no facility to record them, it all came down to okay. I'll, I'll come back to it tomorrow, and it's like, ah, this is I've got the I've got the lyrics. I mean, what they were, and then the chords above it. It's like D minor, F, C, G, and I sing. I mm, can't remember the melody of this one. So the thing is, the good songs you remember. Mm -hmm. the, the ones that weren't so good, it's like can't remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's part of the process. It's still it's still the same, really. So what I, mean, you, I mean, now you've got your iPhone or your, your dictaphone, you record everything. I've got, I've literally got thousands and thousands of snippets. Of you going, mm, 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 like mumbling. No, 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 I don't, I don't mumble. I don't mumble so. Singing beautifully. I, 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 no, I don't I even sing beautifully, but I play a little guitar riff, or, yeah. I, or I have a piano thing, you know, and there might be a lyrical line. It's like, yeah. But you're writing them now, you can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually, yes, it's something that I am, um, whenever I pick up a guitar or sit at the piano, I can write a song, I can write a tune. Yeah. It's the lyrics that always take the time for me. So now you've got all these exercise books full of songs, 14, 15, what, what's your plan? You're going to have to get another band together, I guess, aren't you? Or, what are you going to do with all that stuff? Did you have a well, plan? I didn't have a plan. You just yeah. liked writing the songs? Yeah, I just liked yeah. writing songs and playing guitar. And then um, then one day at school, I was approached by this band that were already in existence if I would come and be their rhythm guitarist. So I thought, yeah, good. Okay, I'll do that. So I thought I'd get in the band and you know, I'd start playing all my songs, except we had a bass player that was uh, opposed to um, not just my songs, just any song that wasn't by the band Bread. You know, the bread. <laughs> <laughs> T Rex, nope. I want to play If. No, uh, um, Slade, nope. Yeah. I want you, baby. So I was in a band for a little while with them, and um, we played a couple of shows in school. And then the singer decided to leave. I don't know why, can't remember why. 
whether he was pushed or whether it was just one of those things. It's like, okay, you know, you've got your A-levels coming up, Mark, you have to leave this band mm -hmm. to destruction. But anyway, what happened was that the guitarist, who was the boss of the band, decided that I was going to be the singer. So I became the singer of the band. So bit by bit, I started getting my songs played by the band, mm -hmm. which the bass player was like, yeah. Bass players, they're always fucking saying. <laughs> <laughs> the main person in the band. Now, so like, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> I could play a lot of instruments, Wayne. Like. <laughs> what is your principal instrument? <laughs> I know the answer to that. <laughs> so you start to take this band over. And you don't start to take it over. The lead guitarist is still a boss. Mm -hmm. But he, he starts to like my songs and think, you know, this is, this, there might be something in this. Mm -hmm. yeah, so anyway, we, we became the um, go-to band locally for youth club dances and you know, weddings in local pub and all that kind of stuff. And it was fun. I mean, we, we played a lot of cover versions, but we would you know, stick one or two of my little songs in. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be all right. So very much about it. Quite a traditional way to learn to be in a band. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, for that time, for that, yeah, for yeah. that time. I mean, it's different now. I, I, I dare say. I think I think it's got to be really hard for you know kids in bands these days. There's nowhere to play. You look at the, look at the gig guys in the back of any magazine. It's either you know what they call heritage acts like the Mission, <laughs> <laughs> or tribute bands like you know the Australian Pink Floyd. <laughs> And there's very, very, very few adverts who, for new young bands, which is really sad to see, actually. And, and you know, I turn up pubs and clubs on this solo tour, and you see a list of gigs, and it's, it's the same. Very few new young bands that have the opportunity to go out and play. And that's, that's it's a great, it's the greatest way of learning how to play. By that time, you could play a wedding, whereas now we'll get a DJ, so yeah. there was opportunity to what they say, yeah, learn your well, chops. Well, the DJs yeah. were starting to get in then, back yeah. then, but you know, but they still like to have the band, you know, as well. Mm. It's a bit like, yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, bingo. Mm. Did you, I mean, you were, were you ambitious then? Or you just wanted to be in a band, or do you think? Was I ambitious? Yeah, you, yeah, I, I was ambitious. I still am. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a pop star. Mm -hmm. I kind of, yeah, always, yeah. I always yeah. caught... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So that's what my mum said. <laughs> it just turned out. There's still, still, still time. <laughs> but with T Rex, you know, I mean, what, what I think to aim for, but you seem too far away. That, that's something that people in London do. Would you feel isolated but way out there on the side? Because then, then anything 100 miles away from London would feel like a thousand miles away, and pop culture was something happening somewhere else. Well, did that feel like that to you or not? Not really. You felt like you were part of this. No, I, didn't, I, I never felt part of it, obviously. But, you felt but, you I, could get there but I was, I was in fan clubs, so I would get, you know, I was in Sweet and Slade and mm -hmm. uh, fan clubs, uh, and T Rex. So I would get the newsletter every two months. It's like, yeah, we're doing this. It's like, and I thought they were writing to me yeah. individually, yeah. and I was like, wow, this is great. You know, so you felt like an outpost of it. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did, and then when you know when when I started going to gig, which was a couple of years later, I would go and hang around the dressing room door in the afternoon, and you know, not not for autographs. I never collected autographs, but just to to see them up, up close. You know, people walking into the dressing room door. You know. So, which kind? Of, those kind of the same bands? Like? Uh, no, by by that point, it was people like was, I remember. I remember Ian Hunter, Nick Ronson. Mm -hmm. I remember um, Doctor Tilbert. Mm -hmm. I remember. Yes. Those <laughs> <laughs> things bad taste. <laughs> no, not really. Not when you're 14, 15 years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you feel like you had to go to a different city maybe, to make this work, or, or did you think it would work where you were? Uh, I got when I left school. I started working for the co-op, and it was it's like okay, this is not really what I want to do, where I want to go. But at the same time, I just felt that this this is where convention leads you. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has to kind of follow this path. And I thought, well, you know what? This ain't gonna work for me. I, I need to get away. And um, circumstances uh, led me to move into Liverpool when I was uh, just 19. 
Was it a deliberate choice going to Liverpool because the football thing, the Beatles thing, or was it just coincidence that you were in the it was partly because of the Beatles and Liverpool Football Club, but also I met a girl from Liverpool, and, uh, and then I moved to Liverpool, and then she chucked me. <laughs> I was like, okay, but I, I've still got the Beatles. I've still got Liverpool. <laughs> and when, when you got to Liverpool, what, I can't remember, what year was you got to Liverpool? Was it seventy-eight? Early, early seventy-eight. Yeah. yeah. And what? Were, did you have an idea what it was like before you got there? Was there a mythical version of it? Or was no, it, I've been there once or twice before. Yeah. And, and so I kind of, you know, knew that it was lots of terraced housing and mm. stuff like that. And it was, it was greyer than Bristol. Yeah. But, um, it, 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 no, it just, it, to me, it felt bohemian. Mm. You know, in, in 18, 19 years old, your idea of bohemian is just, you know, somewhere that's cold and damp, you know. <laughs> Where were you living now? Like, Sorry? Toxteth, Prince's Park area. That no, I, when I first moved up there, I, I lived in, well, I, I got my first flat just off Usham Park, mm -hmm. actually, which is not far from Anfield, not far from Shoebrook, and just a short bus into town. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was basically, I mean, it was a cold water flat. It had no hot water, it had no heat, mm -hmm. and uh, um, a shared bathroom. I loved it. Yeah, come on, it's like away, yeah, away from home. It's like, come on, yeah. I, I, you, you know. landed there just the right time. You I did, really. Post punk yeah. scene, great yeah. post punk scene. Were you aware of that scene before you moved there at all? No. So, it, so you, you, when you got there, you discovered all this thing was going on? Yeah, when I first got there, I mean, I, 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 would, I auditioned for a couple of bands, which were like Cabaret. I was in a band, Cabaret band, for a little while. And actually, my first ever tour was with them. But we're just doing cover versions, and we did, I don't know, we did the northeast and northwest and stuff, and that was that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wanted to play my own songs, really, and um, and then I had a friend that said, "Come to Eric's." Eric's, that's a rubbish name for a club. <laughs> but it's like, okay, well, what is it all about? He says, "A punk club is great. You can come on a Thursday night. It's all local bands, and it costs nothing to get in except you have to." membership. So I went with him and it, I mean, basically it just changed my life. So who, who's on that now? Is it just... Uh, I, I, it was local bands and there uh, was a band with uh, Holly Johnson was fronting, playing bass and singing. And I remember he had like Rupert, Rupert, well not actually, two <laughs> different same trousers. <laughs> two different names. <laughs> uh, but they were red. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had braces on and a white shirt. And uh, it had bright orange hair cut really short. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, quite striking for some, you know, someone used to Mormon church dances. It's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I remember him singing uh, Waiting for the Man, mm -hmm. a the grand song. And that was, my, that was my first night in Eric's. And I met a bunch of people, Pete Wiley being one, Julian Cope. Yeah, you know, how did you manage to meet Pete Wiley on your first night? Because there was only a shy, retiring, tired black people. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, he was the boss, you know, he was the boss of Eric's at that point. Yeah. And anybody who entered through those doors, through those portals, you know, had to talk walk, to walk that, walk that, um, what's the word? I can't remember. The walk had, of terror. The walk, yeah, walk, walk of death. But what, what a great character, Pete. Oh, he's yeah. lovely, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen him for years, though. He's back out playing again. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, he's not so he? Uh, no, never stopped. There's no time off from that. Comes well, by. don't we all, John? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you went to that club and instantly everybody's part of the, that world. The people friendly and... Yeah. Yeah, was, yeah and, and, and you know, the, the you know, local bands were all getting up and playing. I mean, it was... It was pretty, um, I dare say it was pretty rubbish again, but you know, it's exciting <laughs> because people, you know, you're talking to somebody and then the next minute they're on stage. It's like, wow, yeah. that's good. I like that. And at that point, I'd already learned how to play the guitar. So it was a case of mm -hmm. watching these people and saying, you know, bar chords, oh, 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 oh. and it's like, wow, you know, you know what? You don't have to play like Steve Howe mm -hmm. to get up on stage. Yeah, so, you know, it's like, okay. So did you start stepping in? Is it, I suppose it no, I didn't actually. I, I ended up joining the band called The Dead Birds. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. who were, uh, some, a, couple, a couple of the members of the band were, were being in a band with Ian Brody before. And they were part of that scene. 
But anyway, we, we, we were dead birds, but more art school. They were more like death school. Remember death school? Yeah, first band I saw. Were they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were great, actually. Great bands, yeah. yeah, yeah. Northern Roxy Music. Yeah, yeah. second and emo was great. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, they, they were, we were more, a bit more like death school mm -hmm. than we were, I don't know, the pistols or whatever. You know, the, 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 Liverpool never got the pistols. It didn't do it, it didn't have a conventional punk scene, did it? It's, it's, it's always not like really. It's really arty warp and everything. Yeah, I think it's, you know, because we live by the water. I don't know really, because I know the Pistols played there in 76, the same year that they played in Manchester, mm. which revolutionised Manchester. Everybody in Manchester bands for the next 10 years claimed to have been seen the Sex Pistols. <laughs> um, and, but I know they played in Liverpool too, and they were just like, rubbish. <laughs> rubbish, that. They already had these things already in motion, Liverpool, weren't they? they you know, people like Jay Case and all those people. Yeah, only, they I were. Like Burn, obviously, they were only doing the thing, weren't they? They, yeah. I mean, when I when I first got to Liverpool, Big Japan were the big news. Mm. I mean, they were the, the local heroes about to take the next step up. They, 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 sadly, they didn't. But in many ways, it's. I mean, you know, the people that came from Big Japan is like Brody, mm. uh, Drummond, Budgie, um, Holly. I mean, come on, that's pretty good. But you wouldn't put your money on Jane, for sure. Well, well to this day, she's a force of nature. Yes, she, uh, yeah. she is, uh, with, yeah. but only really within Liverpool, which is, you know, which is kind of like, okay, because she deserves to be recognised more widely. Oh, completely, yeah. yeah. But she was she was pivotal in that scene at that point. Mm. So, so what's the same, same as Roger Eagle and Pete Fuller, actually. Yeah, well, Roger was to bring Eric's money, he's booking the bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he used to uh, DJ here in Manchester. Initially, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. yeah. the soul thing. Yeah, I've played there. Yeah, really. So, 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 I can't quite remember the lineage now, how you get to um, Pauline Murray. There's, there's obviously a little gap in between. Uh, a little gap in, yeah, there was a little gap between. Um, there was the Dead Birds, and there was um, Hamby and the Dance. Mm. Hamby was a Liverpool character. Still, still around? He's still, yeah. he's still around, yeah. 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 Um, so I played with him for a while, and, and Hamby really should have been a rock star. I mean, he was in his, in his own mind. <laughs> You've got to start there. Well, yeah. yes, you have. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've learned that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he had it all, though. He was really good looking. And he had good songs, could sing, and um, had the ego, mm -hmm. which is essential in Liverpool. <laughs> Yeah. And, There's a uh, lot of big characters, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. there were. And, and uh, I mean, really, at that point, I was still kind of feeling my way around. And it's like, you know, somebody say hello to me, it's like, oh, what me? <laughs> <laughs> Shy little West Country boy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I played with Hamby, and then um, we split up. And then for a little while, I, I, for a little while, we, um, I had my own little band, but it was rubbish. I wasn't ready to be the singer. Uh, and then I saw an advert in my living maker tell us wanted for a uh, touring band, blah, blah, all that, that kind of stuff. So um, I set a uh, tape off and stuff. And, uh, a few weeks later, um, I got a call. Come in, would you like to come up to Durham to meet Pauline Murray and uh, Robert Blumeyer? Both from Penetration and Visible Girls. Were you aware of them before? Yeah, of course yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So I went up, yeah, I, I, I liked the Invisible Girls. I wasn't a big fan of Penetration. Too kind of shouty and punky. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, was, I wasn't a big fan of punk music, to be, I mean, I liked the New York kind of punk. Mm -hmm. Talking heads, kind of the the artist, yeah. Patti Smith, yeah. Blondie, yeah. yeah, the artist. But a lot more musical to mm -hmm. me, more musical. And um, what was it like going to, to an audition for people who don't know what's, is that quite nerve wracking? You know what? I was a cocky little bugger. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I went to these auditions really expecting to get the job. Mm. And um, well, I, I did. I never failed an audition. <laughs> <laughs> because you, were, uh, you, you could actually play. You were, I could actually play, play, but I was, I was also a little bit of a gobshite, you know, it's mm. like you know, I, could, I could bluff it, mm. you know. It's like, do you know this song? No, but show me the chords, right? Easy. Yeah. 
So anyway, they, they, they you know, called and offered me the job and the next thing I knew I was in the studio with Martin Hannett. Um, what was that like? Well, which Martin turned up? Uh, how many Martins are there? This, there was a genius who did the Joy Vision. Right? Yeah, there was, there was oh, the genius. There was the one who slept underneath the Yeah, that, that was, I got that one too. I got that one too. I got the one that also, he, he, he gave me my first line of cocaine. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got, I got them all. In spaces <laughs> like four or five days, yeah. I, I mean, he was great. He, re he really was great. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a YouTube clip actually with him and Tony Wilson on Granada Report, I think, or something like that, where they're in the studio and they're talking. But this is how a studio works. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, here we go. And this is Wayne's guitar. <laughs> <laughs> did he? I mean, he had a lot of unusual recording techniques. I did, yeah. yeah. Was that was that applied yeah, to you? The most you, most um, uh, unusual was falling asleep on the mixing desk <laughs> while I was playing guitar. <laughs> and did he say he had that thing? Did he? What he would say? Like, weird expressions like. Like loud or more colourful or something. Or he had these little sayings he would say. Was it like that working with him? Or did he, did he have an idea where he was going with it? Was I'm it not sure. Cool? I mean, I, I, when, I remember being in the studio and you know, being, being in the studio with headphones on and playing and lights were low. The lights were low in the control room. I couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And the tape would come down. I'd play the guitar. And say, oh yeah, that's quite good. And then you'd hear the tape rewinding. And the tape start again. And this went on five or six times. And nobody was saying anything in, in, in between. It's like, okay, not really sure. Is this, is this going to be good or what? So I did it like, I don't know, two or three more times. And I thought, you know what? Anyone there? What's going on? Is this any good? And there was no answer. Right? And this, <laughs> when the song starts again. This. So I went into the cold control room and it was dark and all the, the, the lights were, the, you know, the effects and the, the desk and everything. It was, it was quite pretty. And uh, the tape was going, <laughs> and there was no one there. And I thought, you bastards. <laughs> and then it went, before it started going, I heard, <laughs> Looked down underneath the desk and there was Martin Hannett. <laughs> Bless him. So that version of Martin Hannett. I got that one one yeah. night, yeah, and I got the other one another night where you know somebody came in and was like, hey, want some cocaine? Or gack or whatever it was called in those days. So, well, for a penny, you know, I'll have a go. So Martin took me up my first line on, top, on, a, on a, a tape box. Like, what do you do, Wayne? You do a little bit up your right nostril and up your left nostril. Oh, okay, that's all right. And I've never, I've never ever been able to master doing that on the left nostril. I, my left side is really weak. Mm. Always eyesight, hearing, you know, doing cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> the important thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I blew it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Like, and Martin was straight down on the floor going... <laughs> he was obviously a really good coat since he fell asleep about half an hour later. Oh, yeah, well, you know, cocaine's like that. You do a line and then, you know, uh, and ten minutes later you want another, and then, you know, twenty minutes later you're asleep. <laughs> it's not like speed, is it? <laughs> Keeps you awake for twenty-four hours. But it's great sounding record. It's, yeah, it's great. It really yeah. is, actually. I mean, he, he, I mean, yes, it's genius. Mm -hmm. He take all these composite parts, and there's a lot of stuff going on in those records. And Joy Division records too. There's a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. but they sound just—it's just sound so brilliant and clear and crystalline, and, and it's just mm -hmm. got that atmosphere. Whatever he's doing, it, just yeah. sort of, it works. Yeah, I, 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 and he used so many effects on everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and he it, invented and, half the effects. AMS. Yeah. You send them instructions. Well, the, yeah. yeah, AMS are based, are based in Burnley. Or still, used still, to be, yeah. Used to be, yeah. So they're just down the road. So they, you know, they used to come in and like, try this out of mine. It's like, well, yeah, I'll have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, 
guy is a genius. So at that time in Liverpool, you're doing this, and you obviously you must be aware of Pete Wilde, of course, but Pete Burns, you must have been aware of him pretty early on. Yeah, I mean, I, I was introduced to him fairly early on. And, what you know, was he like? Was he, which, I which scary. Pete Burns turned up that day? Yeah, well, he was scary. I mean, he was, you know, he's a scary, intimidating character, wasn't he? I mean, mm. he was hugely flamboyant and with a really caustic tongue, mm. you know, I mean, really, it is, Beware. <laughs> and, um, but, so I, no, I'd seen Pete around town, to, you know, for two or three years, and we'd, you know, be nodding, and it's like, hello, how are you? And I kind of, you know, <coughs> and stuff, I mean, as polite as Pete would be. And then, um, after I'd left Pauline, they, Dead or Alive were looking for new guitars. And, um, so I was asked to join by Pete and his manager at the time, Francesco. And it's like, hmm, I don't know, you know, I was hoping, you know, to join the Bunny Men or something, or the two <laughs> you know, I was hoping I could join one of those bands. Anyway, I eventually got persuaded to go down to, to a rehearsal with them, and it was, it was fucking brilliant. It was like, I, I mean, that, that guy had biggest voice ever, really. Fantastic singer. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and it's been so overlooked, but he, he, he was so talented, mm. really. I mean, he, he didn't write lyrics down, they all came from his head. Mm. And, he's like, come out. and then he'd come back to rehearsal the next day, and he'd remember it all. And it's like, wow, that, that's, a, that's a trick. Mm. And um, on the days that we didn't have a PA, you, you could still hear him singing above the band. It's just so loud. Yeah. yeah. Was it a sense they were trying to change direction with joined? Was there any talk of that? Not consciously, I think. That, I think Pete was consciously, uh, constantly, actually looking for change, <laughs> not just in the music, but in in himself too. I mean, that's why he ended up doing, I suppose, all those you know, plastic surgery procedures. You know, but he was never happy with the way he looked. He had some amazing looks at that time. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. he was he was an amazing look. He was as he. Probably would claim himself he was walking worth of art, you know, and he wasn't a particularly good looking bloke, to be honest, but he looked fantastic when he, when he did the whole thing. It's like, you know. it, it, nowadays, I mean, he'd be striking now, but imagine him walking around 78, 79, 80 Liverpool like that. Is I think, quite I, you know what, John? I think there were more people walking around then that weren't. That were, that were so self conscious. I think, I think we lack colour today. I think you look around when you walk around through the cities, you don't see people with that much colour, that much flamboyance anymore. But perhaps, but I think the people weren't dressed like that. The reaction was a bit stronger, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you'd like to think that we've learned to be more tolerant, but I'm not sure that's the case, actually. Um, I, yeah, I mean, obviously Pete attracted a lot of unwanted attention, but he could, he was a big bloke. So he could give back, give it back, like he, give it back. And he, had, he did have a fucking wicked tongue, mm. you know, he really was quick <laughs> and, 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 and sharp. So, you know, those scallies that used to call him out, they, he would leave them. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like working in creatively? Um, he knew what he wanted, <clears throat> um, but at the same time, he was, he was always, to me, he was always very encouraging um, oh, that's a beautiful way, and that's lovely, that's that strapping guitar. Eh, eh, let's use that for a song. Mm. You know, it's just like one chord, you know. Yeah, see old woman all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, he it, it, it was, um, it was a good time working with him until the last kind of six months, really. I remember when I was saying to you once, and you said, it was you who actually brought the programme into the band, and, yeah. and you programmed yourself out of the band, really. Yeah, yeah. I did. I mean, we, we started going to gay clubs as a, as, a, as a band, as a group of people, as, you know, on Saturday nights. We started going to gay clubs, and we started you listening to this um, music that was... It, it, it veered away from guitar music and more sequence music, and, um, and that's the music we started listening to and wanting to to make. I mean, because you've been playing guitar quite a long time at that point, you're just looking to do create in a different kind of way. Like you say, you, you write to the piano now. Mm. It's just like a whole, this is a different way of writing, a different discipline. Yeah, I, 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 I was, at this point, I was living with somebody 
who was in a synth band, and he had a synth line around the, uh, the, the, the flat. Mm -hmm. And um, I found out if you plug the guitar into the back of the synth and plug the drum machine to this other thing, other input on the synth, the drum machine would trigger the synth when I was playing guitar and go tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a So I was like, wow, that's yeah. a revelation. So I could play with the drum machine and it would be in sync, but it would make the guitar be like, sound like a sequencer. Mm -hmm. So I took that to the band and it was like, wow, let's do everything. Let's do every song like this. <laughs> and uh, bit by bit, you know, we, we got more money. So we ended up buying a, 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 a MIDI system, a keyboard and a, a sequencer. So we ended up, what are you playing there? This, right, okay, put that in the sequencer. Mm -hmm. so, yes, I kind of made myself redundant in the end. But it, but it was, it, it's, it was all about learning and, you know, going somewhere new with it. And it was a revelation, you know. I mean, that, that was my favourite period, that bit. The sort of yeah. disco doors in a way. Yeah, yeah, disco doors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting way of doing it. Misty Circles, Mr. Yeah. Fuller, yeah. great yeah. song, yeah. yeah. So you programmed yourself out of the group. Yeah. So um, you're kicking around, but the record label is looking for bands to, to join, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, yeah, it came to a head, and uh, during the course of recording the first Dead or Alive album, I left the group, and then I went back to Liverpool, and I was kind of hanging around and thinking, mm, what am I going to do next? And um, I got a call from a certain Andrew Eldridge, mm -hmm. saying, uh, we'll look at Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're quite good. <laughs> so you had to go for a Probably quite an unconventional audition. Yeah, yeah, very conventional. Yeah, I, I didn't have to take the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I drove, yeah, we were arranged a rendezvous and I went over to Leeds and uh, went to his house and um, it was uh, all, curt all curtained off. It was like, is this the right house? <laughs> yeah, okay. Knock on the door and, it was, and uh, Claire let us in. Went into the living room and Andrew was sat there in the dark, you know. <laughs> as this is wanting. And uh, he was full bearded at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had no idea what he looked like, you know. I'd never seen pictures of the sisters or anything. So he said, uh, yeah, yeah, which one of you is Wayne? <laughs> me. And because uh, I went with a friend who drove me. And uh, yeah, no, we just sat there and talked for a few hours. We did, you know, lines of speed, we smoked a lot of cigarettes, drank coffee, and uh, I met Gary Marks. And then Craig came in later. He thought Kenny was me, because I was in the bathroom at that point. <laughs> and he, he's like, Craig, so how long have you been playing guitar then? Oh, about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then I came back downstairs and then it's all sorted. Anyway, yeah, so I met Craig for the first time. And um, he carried a lift off us back into town on the way back to Liverpool. And uh, it was, uh, that was that. And a couple of days later, Aldrich called me and said, do you want to join? Yeah. Uh, I need to have tea. You are the sort of age now, aren't you? I am, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know, I am. I've, I've just had one before, I don't need another. Um, do you want well, to... Should we have an intermission? Please have an intermission. Yeah, we'll have a five minute intermission. Have you got something to do? Well, I'll... You got bingo or something? <laughs> <laughs> we could have bingo. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember how to play. Tell us some jokes. Yeah, so you can have a, we'll have a five minute intermission, then we'll come back. Yeah.